Good morning, everybody. This is Jim Manker with the CSAC Finance Corporation. I want to welcome you to uh, the second in a series of webinars with uh, one of our outstanding platinum partners, uh, HealthNet and actually Centene. And we were going back over our records. They've been a partner with uh, CSAC for about 10 years uh, at least. And so we've enjoyed each other's company. We've enjoyed each other's expertise and partnership. And so I want to thank them for their faithfulness uh, and joining us today and sharing uh, their expertise in this area regarding CalAIM 101. Uh, before we get into the webinar, I do wanna welcome uh, my boss and executive director of CSAC, Graham Knaus. Great, uh, thank you, Jim. Good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I think I first just wanna say thank you for your engagement, but also for your perseverance, for your own leadership and patience as you've navigated through the past 16 months, which has been trying at an unbelievable scale for all of us. And so really appreciate what you've been giving back to your community uh, throughout this uh, period of time as we begin to turn a corner uh, and move uh, back to some semblance of normality. So uh, thank you for what you do there. Uh, CalAIM is big and uh, complex in terms of federal, state, and county changes. It's definitely a core part of our advocacy. It has been um, when it was supposed to occur a year and a half ago uh, and uh, when it's uh, going through the process uh, this year. Uh, we've certainly focused most heavily on the behavioral health piece uh, of that, but there are substantial changes to Medi-Cal, touching on the whole system and homelessness and other things. Uh, as uh, we all know, smart implementation and innovation starts with understanding what lies in front of you and then translating that into your own local reality. And that is exactly what uh, today is um, intended to help relay to you uh, and start some dialogue as well. And so with that, um, many thanks to our uh, corporate partners who are going to lead us through this with their great expertise. Uh, let me hand it back to, uh, or hand it over to Randy Kay at ILG. Thank you so much, Graham, and thank you, Jim, for this opportunity to work with CSAC, CSAC Finance Corporation, and your partners in HealthNet and Centene. And I just want to give the audience a chance to have some understanding of how today's session will work. I'll be serving as your tech host, and feel free to send me a question through the chat box, and I will work with you on the back end. Uh, just a brief description of today's uh, session. Uh, CSAC is pleased to partner again with HealthNet and California Health and Wellness to offer all county supervisors staff and others an opportunity to hear more about the California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal CalAIM initiative through our upcoming CalAIM webinar. CalAIM is a new multi-year initiative by the Department of Healthcare Services, implementing broad delivery system, program and payment reform across the Medi-Cal program. All counties will play a role in CalAIM system transformation. Learn about the key features of CalAIM, including the Enhanced Care Management, ECM benefit, and in lieu of services offerings which are key features of Medi-Cal's framework for addressing social determinants of health and improving health equity statewide. Medi-Cal Managed Health Care Plans, MCPS, will be responsible for administering both ECM and ILOS in close collaboration with counties. All right, and today we'll have um, introductions and opening remarks by Martha Santana Chin. We'll go through Cal AIM uh, with a presentation by Sydney Turner. We'll have questions and answers towards the end of the session, and then Brianna Lehrman will complete our closing remarks. We'll be facilitating questions and answers throughout the, uh, the chat. We'll be welcoming all of your questions, so please submit them. And uh, we'll be working on the back end to make sure all of those questions get answered. Now, um, for those of you who are new to the GoToWebinar format or you've gotten so used to Zoom that this has been a fun little switch over, I just wanted to offer you that there's a questions box where you can type in your questions and that will get to us on the back end and that's how we'll um, conduct our Q&A today. Now, you know, the Institute for Local Government is very pleased to be work partnering and working on these webinars. We offer a number of services and programs for our cities, counties, and special districts that we work with. And we are so pleased to be affiliated with CSAC as well as the League of California Cities and the Special Districts Association. Um, just a bit briefly about the Institute. We have um, materials, resources, training, and technical assistance available in leadership and governance, civics education, and workforce programs public engagement, as well as in sustainable and resilient communities. 
We welcome you to reach out and connect with us on other topic areas outside of healthcare services. And um, just as a reminder, we are here to help you. We have a great website, www.ca-ilg.org, and happy to answer any questions related to other local government services. Now, um, I've shared a little bit about me. You've heard about who's going to be uh, speaking today, but we would love to hear more about you. And so we are going to take just a couple of minutes to conduct some audience polls, and we welcome you to participate um, by selecting an answer from your computer screen. And I'll go ahead and launch that first poll right now. Now, this first poll is going to be about your role with the county. And we are going to be asking you to tell us, um, are you a county supervisor or an elected official? Do you um, serve in a county health department? Do you serve in a county behavioral health department? Are you a provider? Do you work in a hospital or clinic? Are you part of a CBO? I'll take just a moment to look for those answers to come on through. And I'm still seeing those clicks take place, so I'll just close out the poll in just a second. Alrighty, looks like we've got a great mix here. And I'm gonna go ahead and share those results. Looks like we have about 5% of our participants today are county supervisors or elected officials. And a majority of you are with the county health departments. And then we have quite a few from our county behavioral health departments. Thank you so much for joining. And also wanna thank those of you who are providers, hospital or clinic based. Uh, we see you coming through as well. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to ask one more poll. Oops, we got to do one more poll. Now we're asking you, what is your level of familiarity with um, Medi-Cal managed care aspects of CalAIM? And this will help us get an understanding of where you're at in this process. So our speakers today can really kind of tailor their remarks and help get you um, as familiar as possible in our time together. Quite a few responses coming through. Thank you so much for participating. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out these responses. So please get those last clicks in. All right, here's what we're seeing. We have about 26 of you, 26 percent of you, about a quarter of you are not familiar with CalAIM. So it's great that you're here and you'll be able to learn from the experts. And we've got about 52 percent of you that are somewhat familiar with CalAIM. And then, of course, we have um, some that are fairly familiar, perhaps coming to here to look for a little bit more information. And 5 percent um, of you that are extremely familiar. And uh, we just appreciate the wide audience that we have here so that we can help provide um, information to you that is beneficial to all county representatives. And our last poll is coming up right now. This is going to be about um, kind of how are you, um, what managed care aspects of CalAIM are you most interested in learning about? So these are items we'll be covering today and just want to make sure we are um, sharing with you what you are most interested in learning about. We will be going through all of these topics and um, we'll be looking for more um, more guidance on where it is that you need the most assistance. Lots of clicking happening here, a lot of options. All right, I'm gonna give this one just a few more seconds because I see a lot of rapid clicking happening. Okay. All right, it looks like we have about 12% of you are looking for information about incentives. 35% of you are looking for enhanced care management benefit information. 26% of you are looking for population health management information. 15% looking for more content around in lieu of services. And then about 12% of you selected other. So certainly we've got kind of a big need across, across the board and you have a great team of experts here to really kind of help guide you in this content. So we'll be moving forward with that presentation. All right, and thank you. Um, oh, just a note, we had somebody mention that we did not list specifically human services agency staff. We are uh, very well aware that there's a number of staff that are involved in working with counties to make sure that this project is successful. Um, certainly it was not intentional. Our survey was limited to a number of audiences or options on those answers, but we do appreciate that you are here and so glad that we have human services on board. All righty. 
So um, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, send over those controls now to our team over at HealthNet. So Sydney, I'm passing it over to you. All right. Um, well, this is Brianna Learman. I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. And Sydney, can you give me a nod just to confirm that you can hear my voice? All right. It's not a Zoom unless someone forgets to unmute, right? So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, that survey is really helpful for us to understand you as an audience because we want to make sure that we calibrate and focus on the things based on your level of comfort with the managed care aspects of Calaline you know, and, and what you particularly want to hear more about. So thank you so much for your responses. It's very helpful. Looks like we're right in the middle in terms of um, the level of understanding, pretty evenly split across the different components um, with some exceptions. I wondered if the low response um, or level, the relatively speaking lower level of interest on incentives is because maybe we need to talk about them more because they are an incredible opportunity for funding um, through the plans with, with all of you. So anyway, I'm excited, obviously excited to get moving. Um, I'm Brianna Learman. I am the Regional Vice President of Business Development with Centene Corporation. And a quick word here, because you have now heard three organizations referenced in the context of HealthNet. So as so many of you know, um, Centene is the parent company of HealthNet and California Health and Wellness, who are the two Medi-Cal plans um, through our family of companies that serve the state of California across uh, 31 counties. Um, so I'm here today uh, to help facilitate some questions and work with Sydney and Martha on that. Um, but before we launch in, just a quick acknowledgement that, you know, Colleen, like Graham mentioned, is, in my own words, sweeping. It has, I think, approaching 20 components. And today we're focusing really on the, those that touch um, and re touch managed care and really require close collaboration between the Medi-Cal managed care plans, all of you at the counties and with providers and other organizations. And this comes at a time, the sweeping reform at a time when you are, of course, um, not far outside of or, or still reeling from COVID and loss of demand. So we recognize that a 101 is very helpful uh, for so many of you as the survey showed still maybe would, would benefit from that. We, like I said, at HealthNet and throughout California Health and Wellness are in 31 counties. So this, this overview is not specific to us in Colleen. It is something we hope is valuable to any county and any, any entity because all 58 counties in the state are impacted by Colleen. It's not just about HealthNet counties and not just about how HealthNet is operationalizing. So we hope it's helpful from that regard. We'll, of course, share some insights of what we're learning. We have um, the vast majority of our counties are in phase two. Um, just as a point of reference to share what we're doing, we are actively mapping and engaging with our phase one counties through some decisions and understanding you know, what we need to deploy uh, and work together on to execute CalAIM. So we really hope that this overview is helpful for understanding CalAIM, what it means for your county if you're one of our partners and even if you're not one of our partners. Um, based on the survey, we hope that um, for those of you who are somewhat familiar or even um, comfortably familiar, you are comfortable asking as many questions as you want. We want to, we're happy to offer insights on how we're handling things um, and even speak in terms of generalities um, because Sydney and Martha live and breathe Colleen and can probably talk about so many of its components in their sleep. So finally, because we've done a lot of this work with counties, we would flag um, some things we think you should be thinking about as we're walking through the overview of CalAIM and its components, which is when we're talking about enhanced care management and the incentives, the infrastructure, incentive opportunities, the in lieu of services options, um, that you're thinking about what these mean for your county in terms of what you're providing today, um, where the overlap is and where it may not be, where the gaps are what role you want to play, if you haven't already thought about that or um, thinking about that a bit more. And then flagging as well that at Sydney's going to walk through a slide that has some timelines on it. And just make note that there are decisions coming up that need to make be made quickly relative to the scale of these decisions. Um, and this is really a, a timeline set by the department. So with that, I hope you think about those things as I were walking through their overview. 
and I'll turn it over um, to Martha to get us started. So thank you. All right. Um, th thanks, Brianna, and thank you to all of you for joining. We know, you know, uh, an hour and a half, an hour of your time is precious nowadays. We're all running fast and trying to keep up with all the changes and issues that we're having to deal with day in and day out. So um, I'm Martha Santana Chin. I um, run our Medi-Cal business for the state of California for HealthNet and California Health and Wellness. And, you know, before I dive into what is on the slide, I just wanted to share a, a few perspectives. One is, um, as Brianna mentioned, this uh, work that we've embarked on with the leadership of the DHCS is quite impressive. And it's um, really centered around the idea that we've got to do our very best to improve the quality of care, the life and the health outcomes of the populations that we serve in every single county that we um, serve throughout the state with the Medi-Cal program. And it's pretty broad, uh, delivery system reform, program reform, um, payment reform, and so it's one of those times where um, it, it's, it's really just remarkable change that's coming at us. And, um, you know, being a health plan that's been really partnered with DHCS since the mid 90s and, and serving the Medi-Cal population, we've been seeing a lot of change over the years. We're very excited about this change in particular. It really does take us into that next level in our quest for providing holistic, you know, person-centered care. And you know that's something that I know many of you, many of us have you know tried to really um, embrace in our own personal careers. So it's very exciting. Um, where we are right now also allows us the opportunity to catalyze a different level of partnership at a local level. So what we do with use county agencies, what we do with um, you know traditional physical health providers, you know the behavioral health world, the social services world, it's going to require us all to dig in, look at what's happening on the ground and do our best to integrate. And um, that's exactly what's happening today. There are a lot of discussions that, that are happening at a local level that are unprecedented types of discussions to really help us sort through what we've got to do to integrate delivery systems in a much more intentional way. And so um, we do hope that today opens the door for a new level of conversation between each one of you and your plan partners at the, at, the, at the local level. And to the extent that you're serving in any of the counties that we participate in, you know, we're happy to, to connect with you. Um, so what you see here on the slide is a little bit about us. So HealthNet was founded in 1977, um, originally started as a California-based plan. Um, We've been in the Medi-Cal program serving Medi-Cal individuals since the inception of the program. Uh, the color coding here just displays the different entities that serve California's Medi-Cal business um, in, in, throughout in, in various models. So the orange um, counties are served by California Health and Wellness. It's a name that you'll hear. Um, the green counties is served by HealthNet. Um, uh, through a subcontract with Molina. And Magenta is really where HealthNet, the primary commercial plan contract holder. And in the purple counties, Calviva in the Central Valley there, we essentially um, are the back office administrator for all things that Calviva is required to do for the Medi-Cal program in, the, in that specific market. So we have um, a great deal of experience uh, working in a variety of different models and in a variety of different relationships with county agencies, local health authorities, um, as well as a commercial plan partner. We serve well over 3 million members across the state, across multiple lines of business. Um, most of our business is government sp sponsored program. Um, Medi-Cal is our primary line of business. Uh, earlier, Brianna mentioned that we serve 31 counties. That is through the Medi-Cal line of business, but um, overall, across all of our lines of business, we serve 58 counties and um, have a network 85,000 providers strong. So um, very committed to California, um, you know, born and raised in California, if you will, HealthNet is, and um, Centene having uh, acquired us as an organization really helped to strengthen what we do for from a Medicaid space because 
not only do we have a wide array of perspectives and having um, the honor and privilege to serve Californians in, in a number of different counties, but we also bring it with us perspective from across the nation. And so um, we hope that that experience and that perspective is really going to enrich the way uh, that we engage with you and how we design the program in partnership with all of you and the DHCS um, and all things Kelling going forward. So again, thank you for uh, joining us today. I'm gonna hand it over to Sid who is gonna walk us through um, the CalAIM overview and then you know, I'll be back for um, question and answer, so thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sydney Turner. I am the manager of health policy for, for both HealthNet and California Health and Wellness. And I see a number of familiar names um, on this webinar. So, so nice to well speak to you all again and thank you for the opportunity to come back and talk about my favorite subject, which is um, Cal AIM. So um, before we dig into enhanced care management and the in lieu of services, um, just wanted to touch on um, Cal AIM as a whole, a little bit more about the big picture. So, you know, as Graham and Martha and Brianna mentioned, Cal AIM is a monster. Um, we are going to survive this implementation if we just take some bite sized chunks. So, though we haven't listed all of the components on this slide, we just want to focus your attention. Um, to some of the activities in 2022 that are upcoming that we really need to start um, uh, focusing on and, and uh, strategizing around. So um, on, on your right, I'm sorry, on your left here, um, there are three different components of, of the CalAIM program. Um, and so we will be focusing on the enhanced care management and the in lieu of services. Uh, but I just want to make a note that um, the different and various components of Cal AIM, they are intended to complement each other, though that they're on a different uh, implementation timeline. So, for instance, um, enhanced care management and in lieu of services are considered some of the foundational elements of Cal AIM, but also a foundational component and element um, of the forthcoming population health management strategy requirement um, that managed care plans will have to adhere to in 2023. Um, just want to flag that Health Net California Health and Wellness, and I believe many plans already have population health management strategies. So we are all um, waiting for the policy to be uh, finished being developed uh, so that we can continue to tweak our programs and strategies to meet the intent and spirit um, of Cal AIM. On the right, um, just flagging some of the 2022 priorities. Um, so we'll dig into enhanced care management and in lieu of services, which is number one and number two. Um, number three, major organ transplant, um, another tentacle or component of CalAIM. Uh, so currently when a managed care member um, is identified for needing a transplant service, we disenroll them to fee for service to receive those transplant services. Um, come 1-1-2022, we get to keep these members enrolled in our uh, managed care plans so that we can care for the member throughout their entire transplant experience um, and care for any of those post-transplant services and then continue on care coordinating or managing um, the members need uh, as they come back to um, the regular old Medi-Cal services, if you will. And then um, also number four, I would imagine many of you on this, uh, on this meeting here could actually probably school me um, in, in the updates related to the behavioral health system, um, but we're really looking forward to all the work that everyone's been doing to further align um, on the updated definition for medical necessity um, and criteria related to uh, mild to moderate versus seriously mentally ill. So um, thank you all for all of your hard work on this effort. We know it's not easy, um, but, but we really are looking forward to the alignment and standardization as much as possible statewide. Okay, uh, this slide is just a little bit of a reminder as to what Brianna and Martha were saying. Uh, if you couldn't tell, um, Cal AIM, especially Enhanced Care Management and in lieu of services is full of opportunities opportunities to um, change how we um, administer healthcare, you know, flip it on its head a little bit and, and get some care coordination on steroids in place, um, but also an opportunity to fill some of those um, gaps related to capacity and infrastructure needs by county. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, when we get to the slides related to the incentives. So just reminding you to think about all of the wonderful opportunities that we're about to talk about. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll catch Calame fever. Um, 
and, and help us and other managed care plans further strategize about um, where we can partner to inject funds into your counties and communities. All right, uh, any questions before we start digging into the details of enhanced care management and in lieu of services? Nope, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Great, all righty. <clears throat> So where did enhanced care management and in lieu of services um, come from? So DHCS took the lessons learned um, and the things that worked well from current waiver programs such as the Health Homes Program, Whole Person Care, and the CCI. Uh, the Health Homes Program and Whole Person Care are scheduled to sunset at the end of 2021. Um, and then the CCI is also winding down at the end of 2022 um, to lift and shift over into some forthcoming components um, of Cal AIM. So, when you think about the Health Homes Program, uh, this program was intended and, and does target members with complex care needs with uh, in-person intensive care management interventions provided by community-based organizations. Um, for the Health Homes Program, those members who do choose to opt in or enroll, um, they have an individual care coordinator and care team for all of their physical and behavioral health needs. And the Health Homes Provider also links members to community services um, such as housing support services um, or any social services that the member needs to remain stable in the community. So essentially, the Health Homes Program uh, has been a precursor for the coming enhanced care management uh, benefit. The Health Homes Program is not in every county, um, but uh, HealthNet has some experience in quite a few of them, and we really are looking forward to bringing some of the lessons learned that we, we have um, experienced and apply it to um, our implementation efforts statewide. Just a little bit about the whole person care program. This program is intended to target high utilizers, those that are homeless, uh, maybe the reentry population, other high risk populations to address the health and behavioral health and social needs of high cost beneficiaries through multiple county systems. Uh, each whole person care program is unique and different. Um, if there's not a t-shirt out there already, I think I'm gonna make one. Uh, but the saying goes, uh, when you've seen one county, you've seen one county. So essentially many of the lessons learned from the whole person care programs are really related to in lieu of services. Um, the counties who did opt in and choose to participate in the whole person care program were able to design the program unique to their county needs. So eligibility criteria, um, bundled services that kind of sort of equate to enhanced care management, bundled services that if you tease them apart, uh, become the in lieu of services. Um, so a phenomenal amount of lessons learned that we can pull from, from our whole person care programs um, and partners. So on your right here, uh, this is my attempt at a picture, but essentially taking all of the good stuff from health homes, whole person care and the CCI, put it into a funnel, shaking it up uh, and you get Cal AIM. All right, um, here's a little bit more about enhanced care management and in lieu of services. So um, ECM, what the heck is it? Uh, it is a whole person approach to care intended to meet the member where they are in the community. This benefit is intended to be an additional layer of support and it's primarily intended to be rendered in person. So slightly different than um, regular old case management that you might experience through the managed care plans where that's primarily over the phone. We're really looking forward to this benefit that will be implemented statewide in phases um, to really um, engage deeply with our, our members who are targeted for this additional layer of support through our community-based organizations. Um, so if you couldn't tell, uh, the role of the Enhanced Care Manager is to coordinate all primary acute behavioral health, developmental, oral, and long-term services and supports for the member. Um, this could even include participating in the care planning process, uh, regardless of the setting. Uh, and if you have heard me speak about uh, enhanced care management before, I do fondly call this benefit care coordination on steroids. It, it is going to be a really, really neat program um, where each uh, member identified and who chooses to participate in the program um, will be assigned one enhanced care management provider to be their primary point of contact. Again, really just making sure that they support the member in navigating our complex delivery system and supporting and, and providing linkages to all of those clinical and non-clinical needs. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, um, you can see that there are six components 
core components to enhance care management. Um, just want to flag for folks that um, DHCS has recently added outreach and engagement as a core service component, um, which is really fantastic. We've learned through our health homes programs that it takes a phenomenal amount of effort um, to in engage and keep these members that we're identifying as the most vulnerable um, engaged throughout um, the experience. <clears throat> on your um, left hand side also you can see that there are some examples as to who can be um, enhanced care management providers um, this is not a limited list it's just a, an example of all of the different partners that we we have the opportunity to explore um, so we're really really excited to uh, leverage current and existing relationships with some of these entities but then also explore some new ones with community-based organizations and grassroots entities who have the experience and expertise to serve the populations of focus. All right, a little bit about in lieu of services. So in lieu of services are medically appropriate and cost-effective alternatives to state plan services. I fondly call these instead of something more expensive services. So instead of uh, services, services such as an ER inpatient or a skilled nursing facility stay. I want to flag that while the enhanced care management benefit is um, required for managed care plans statewide, um, the in lieu of services are considered voluntary for managed care plans by county. Um, so this is the part and piece of Cal AIM where DHCS is allowing some flexibility um, for the managed care plans to really work with county and local stakeholders to identify where the gaps and needs are to prioritize the in lieu of services that we want to stand up on day one and continue to work towards standing up additional in lieu of services until we get all 14 stood up uh, by 2027 to support a statewide MLTSS. Another example for how all of the lovely components um, of Cal AIM are intended to um, partner and piggyback off of each other. In the grid below, you can see um, the 14 different in lieu of services grouped together um, kind of by a uh, topic. So um, underneath the housing support side, we've got housing navigation, housing deposits, housing tenancy and sustaining services. Uh, beneath that uh, are your transition support services. So skilled nursing facility transition and diversion to assisted living facilities or community transition services and nursing facility transitions to home. Within the post-acute support services, DHCS is pre-approved in lieu of service list includes short-term post-hospitalization housing, recuperative care, sobering centers, respite services, day habilitation, um, and then finally the at-home support services that DHCS has identified as a priority are personal care and homemaker services, home modifications, meals and medically tailored meals, and asthma remediation. I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions on this slide. We will continue to dig into ECM and kind of sort of how it all works, but want to see if there's any uh, top of mind questions that we can respond to now. Hey, this is Brianna. Um, nothing coming through in the chat. I'll confirm with Randy Kay that she's not seeing anything. And while she's doing that, just flag for folks, please feel free to ask us questions in the chat and we're happy to read them out and answer them. No pressure if you don't feel like your calling knowledge um, is, is as robust as you probably think it needs to be. There are no silly or stupid questions here. Um, I just personally had the privilege and the pleasure of reading that lovely 230 page proposal more than a few times um, and participating and listening to the stakeholder process as DHCS developed um, some of these guidelines and policy, uh, which occurred pre-COVID, <laughs> so quite some time ago. But please feel free to ask questions uh, of any sort. So Sydney, um, I'll, I'll flag more um, a statement or an insight. So I would imagine that maybe some folks who check the not very familiar box may be looking at this and saying, well, what does this mean for me and my county? So I would just underscore here that when you're looking at ECM, just our, that this is an, a, a robust benefit that's going to be available through managed care to identify population groups, which we'll talk about. Um, and this goes back to the question we suggested that we were thinking about, of course, um, to the extent you're not already doing that already, which is when you look at this benefit available through managed care and the populations it's going to cover and the lieu of services over on the right, the question you're going to be asking is, what are we already doing today in our county through county services, um, through CBOs? Where's the overlap? Where are the gaps? And those are the things 
um, we're, you know, we're saying that the plans and the counties and the other community entities are going to need to work closely together to close those gaps and to leverage is already being done today. Thank you, Bree. That's absolutely right. Um, and, and as she talks about identifying what we do today and the gaps in place, um, we can do this in collaboration with other health plans. Um, and in fact, um, because HealthNet has the privilege of having such a diverse footprint throughout the state, um, you know, we have become fast friends with many of our uh, plan partners and, and have really good experience and engaging together and collaborating on working through what we need to do to make sure that your county has what it needs to have a successful enhanced care management and lieu of service program. So yes, we are absolutely looking for and need your insights as to what in lieu of services should be prioritized for day one. Where do we have gaps and holes that we can partner to fill? Um, and how do you want the additional in lieu of services to be stood up or prioritized um, as time goes on? So I did mention the in lieu of services are voluntary. Um, the managed care plans are working together to ensure that we do offer as much as possible the same in lieu of services. We also have the opportunity to piggyback off of each other's enrollments. Uh, just another um, area where DHCS is allowing flexibility and the managed care plans are coming together to reduce administrative burden for potential partners. So Sydney, there's a, um, there is a question that just came through. Um, the question is, so when we're talking about Lewis Services Bundle, does that mean we have to provide, oops, I, um, we have to provide all of them? So for example, we've got our housing support, do we, do we have to choose this housing support or can we choose just deposit? So how do, how do bundles versus individual selections work? Thank you. Um, you. If you are able and capable of offering the entire bundle, that is fantastic. But we um, are also partnering, partnering with organizations um, who can only maybe render housing deposits out of the housing support bundle, if that makes sense. One, the other, all of it, you can be an ECM. Yeah, am I, am I... Go for it, Martha. Yeah, sorry. So um, I think um, just to add to that, um, if the question is whether a plan must provide all services, um, the answer to that question is plans have the latitude to provide um, single components of the bundle. The, the bundle, think about the bundle as something that we've done to just organize our thinking, but it's the individual services that we have to select as a health plan to provide and phase in over time. And I think um, in addition to that, you know, what, what Sydney mentioned is right on. So if you happen to be a housing services providers and you can help partner with health plans, three, you know, I think plans would be very eager to hear from you. If you are a housing services provider, as an example, and you want to provide one of the three, we'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. Thank you, Martha. Any other questions? Okay, let's keep nerding out on enhanced care management. <clears throat> so this next slide, um, again, attempting to give you a picture to illustrate how um, enhanced care management um, will be working. So I, uh, here we have, are multiple delivery systems that can be difficult for members to navigate on their own. And here you have the enhanced care management provider wrapping themselves with the, around the member to really support all of those care coordination um, needs, whether it's clinical, non-clinical, um, community and social services, uh, doing whatever it takes to ensure that member um, gets the care and support that they need to remain stable in the county and community. Um, so again, Enhanced care management is intended to be an additional layer of support. Um, I know through um, several discussions with different behavioral health agencies, many of you have programs that do much of what enhanced care management is designed to do today. Enhanced care management is not coming in to take over your programs. In fact, we actually see this as an offering to complement your current county care coordination um, program. So, whether it is having the enhanced care manager closely collaborate with the mental health or behavioral health provider who's rendering services or, or doing some care coordination activities for that, that member, that close partnership between providers will help the member you know, even more effectively access the care that they need. Um, enhanced care management can also um, complement your current service offering by 
being an additional layer with underneath maybe your SMI um, care coordination programs. It's my understanding that some counties have some very specific eligibility criteria for those care coordination programs. Um, and I know you all have big Medi-Cal hearts like I do and want to do what's best for any member that comes through your doors or systems. So, um, you know, enhanced care management could also be another program that sits underneath your SMI and catches those individuals who do need mental health services and supports from you all, but maybe don't necessarily meet the criteria of your SMI programs. Um, so there is lots of opportunity to be creative here in how we um, fit the enhanced care management benefit into your counties. And, and this is where managed care plans are really looking to listen and learn and understand the role that you wanna play, um, whether it's being an enhanced care management provider, maybe you are a hub, uh, meaning that you are the, the central point or the intermediary and you leverage your current network um, to be the enhanced care management providers. All of those things are, are, are things that the managed care plans wanna understand and learn from you and partner so that we can enable and support you to fill the role that you wanna play with this coming um, benefit. Any questions on this slide? Is it getting a little bit more clear around wrapping ourselves around the, the member for enhanced care management? Uh, maybe I can give a couple of examples. So um, for instance, individuals who are experiencing homelessness um, the ECM provider could conduct street outreach or coordinate with shelters, hotels, or motels, um, including those participating in Project Room Key or Home Key, um, to um, ensure that that those individuals get hooked up with um, housing navigation, maybe some sustaining services. Um, do they need linkages to recuperative care or other community partners and services um, to connect the target individuals with these in these settings? Um, for instance, individuals with SMI, the enhanced care manager could possibly do some initial contact and engagement with the member um, in settings such as the psychiatric inpatient units or institutions for mental um, health disease or, or residential settings. So um, this really is our opportunity to flip healthcare on its head um, and do that case management care coordination in, in person to really drive the engagement that we need from members so that they can access care at the appropriate levels. Um, and get the supports that they need. So Sydney, question came through. If you can backtrack your slide. Um, sure. So two things. The question is, one question, are the slides going to be available? Yes, we will send them out, no problem. Um, and then second is about when you're looking at this matrix, where does county public health fit in? I think the answer is it depends, but I'll, I'll turn to you to answer. Sure thing. It, it does depend. It depends on the role you want to play. Um, and, and there's a couple of different experiences out there, at least from my perspective and the engagement I've been doing um, with some of the counties. So there are counties who bring their, their public health and their behavioral health agencies together and figure out how they want to do enhanced care management together. Um, there have also been instances where we are partnering with public health and separately behavioral health in that county um, to, to fill the you know, fill the need there and understand the role they want to play with enhanced care management. Um, so it is completely up to you how you want to um, fit into this space. Um, you know, usually it takes a couple of internal conversations uh, on the county side to figure out how they want to possibly um, fill this role. And then whatever you all decide, the managed care plans are, are ready um, and able to engage in those conversations and, and, and respect your, your wishes. Make your ECM dreams come true. So, Sid, would you mind if I add a couple of other examples Thanks. to kind of hit it home? So, I think Sid's exactly right, um, and I'm going to turn on my camera here for just a second, but Sid, Sid is exactly right. Um, it really depends. I'll give you a couple of examples. We, we have been speaking with a few um, departments of public health that actually run their own program. Um, one in particular is centered on substance use disorder counseling. And one of the things that we're doing with them is trying to figure out how we can partner with them to really do a lot more workforce development and expand their program to have a broader reach within the county. Um, another thing that we've been talking to a number of um, public health departments about is, you know, data, right? The, the public health departments have a wealth of information, insights on their counties that um, plans may not necessarily have. And so, um, another way to partner is to sort through how we might be able to leverage or leverage um, public health data to inform, inform our population health management strategies and then just the day-to-day the -day, um, 
interventions for the, the people that we're serving at a very granular level, because even within a county, right, specific communities, specific needs, and oftentimes we find that the departments of public health have, you know, a wealth of information that can really inform our thinking. Thank you, Martha. And, and Brianna made me aware there's a question in the chat about enhanced care management being um, no wrong door. Um, so I think the answer is kind of. Uh, and let me explain a little bit about um, the process. Definitely when it comes to, um, there's a, a few different ways that members can be identified for enhanced care management. Um, the process will go like this. Uh, the managed care plans are responsible for leveraging any and all data that we have access to and, and we'll be working to obtain access to additional data sources, as Martha mentioned, to identify members who are eligible for enhanced care management. Um, HealthNEC and California Health and Wellness, we do not intend to be the enhanced care management providers. We intend and are working to actively partner and contract with community-based organizations, county agencies, grassroots entities who have the exper expertise in serving these populations of focus, which we'll get into the next slide. Once the managed care plan identifies individuals who are potentially eligible based on the data that we have access to, we're going to send it to the enhanced care manager um, who's appropriate um, for that population of focus to then go do the outreach and engagement, um, find the members where they're at in the community to see if this is a benefit that the, that the member wants to capitalize on. So from there, the enhanced care manager is really working to build trust with the member um, and complete a clinical and non-clinical assessment. Um, the assessment will then be turned into um, a care plan and those care plans will be shared with the managed care plans. Um, the care plan is a mechanism for us to further understand what the members needs are um, and then also um, support our enhanced care managers in ensuring that the members achieving all of the outcomes that they've um, indicated they want to achieve in that care plan. Um, it's a little bit of the monitoring and oversight part and piece there. Um, where the health plans are working to align on expectations. <clears throat> um, of course, after you've done your care plan, you've sent it to your to your, to your favorite managed care plan. Um, we then there is obviously claim submission, um, you know, related to the enhanced care management benefits. Um, and then of course, there's going to be some other um, file transactions and things like that. So so managed care plans will be identifying members, but also. Um, we are working to align with other managed care plans on referral expectations and a process that we can hopefully standardize up and down the state. Um, because Health Net's in so many counties, I've made it my personal mission as Sydney Turner um, to drive standardization <laughs> wherever uh, possible. Um, so we are engaging with primary care providers, clinics, hospital systems, advocacy agencies to further understand what we need to care for in this referral process. Um, to make sure it's clean and clear and crisp as to how to get um, individuals identified maybe in the ER, um, you know, access quickly to enhanced care management or notify the enhanced care manager that, that they have an enrolled member um, that is needing some additional supports and services. So it is the managed care plans identifying members, um, then also um, mechanisms to ingest referrals from providers, family members, county, community, whomever thinks that there's a member out there with an additional need. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Um, so this next slide here is uh, more about the populations of focus and the implement implementation timeline. Um, on the right, these are the counties by phases. So phase one counties are those counties which had a health homes or a whole person care program. Um, and then the phase two counties did not have a health homes or whole person care program. Um, so you all have the benefit of watching your, your other county friends and partners go first um, and allowing the managed care plans to really get those expertise we need in place to find some processes so that we can effectively work together on developing an ECM and enrolled service network. So there are six different populations of focus. Um, the, the populations of focus that will be going live in 2022 is if you are a health homes or a whole person care member, um, you will be grandfathered into enhanced care management. The managed care plans are required to automatically authorize those members for the ECM benefit. <clears throat> those members will then be reassessed six months later to ensure that enhanced care management is the right level of support. Um, another population of focus for 2022 are individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So this includes 
um, kiddos and families too. And then um, also adults who are considered high utilizers, adults who have SMI and SUD. Um, so as you can see here on the grid, uh, phase one counties are going live with these populations of focus on January 1st of 2022. And then a quick six months later, our phase two counties will be going live with those three populations of focus July of 2022. <clears throat> And then finally, in 2023, all counties, regardless of phase one or phase two, um, will be going live supporting enhanced care management for individuals transitioning from incarceration. Um, this is a both, both adults and kids, uh, members eligible for long-term care at risk of institutionalization, nursing home uh, residents transitioning from community, um, and then of course, all of the children who have complex needs that meet the high utilizers, SMI, SUD populations um, of focus criteria. I'm gonna pause here for a little bit. Any questions? Thanks, Adi, Brianna. Um, so question is, what percentage of, the, uh, of our beneficiaries do we estimate will actually meet the criteria for ECM? That's a question that comes up a lot. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so if you couldn't tell already, not all of the policy around enhanced care management and in lieu of services is finalized. Um, yet. And on the next slide, which I'll just flash it so you can look at some of the good details here, um, we have some materials that are going to be forthcoming. So everything that we've heard from the state thus far, uh, you know, they were baselining it, assuming that roughly 1% of the entire um, Medi-Cal population will be enrolled in enhanced care management. Um, you know, but as managed care plans start digging into how we're going to identify members for these populations of focus, we are definitely seeing a volume that exceeds 1% um, of our Medi-Cal population. So Martha, I'm not sure if you want to add some more information from, from your collaboration with DHCS related to um, volume? Sure. Um, so I think um, it's really hard to tell. Um, DA, as Sydney said, DHCS was estimating about 1%. Some initial um, ranges that we've heard from other health plans and then, you know, based on our own data as uh, best as we can pull it, right, we have imperfect data, um, we're, we, we could see up to, based on HealthNet's data, um, up to 11% of the population potentially qualifying. And I say potentially because, um, again, we have imperfect data. Um, we don't have... Uh, assessments and details on every single individual that's stratifying as someone who may benefit from um, these services um, rule out whether or not they actually qualify. So um, we've heard other plans talk about, you know, potentially in the mid-teens, um, while others are saying it's probably closer to the five. So, you know, it really is hard to tell at this point. I think once we start to better understand how strong uh, the referral patterns are going to be. Um, we're going to get better at this as we start to integrate more data sets from, you know, our county partners, health um, services agencies, et cetera. Um, we'll get more, uh, we'll get smarter about it. But for now, I would say it's probably in the range of a little less than 1% to probably 15%, depending on who you ask. Just to add some more color there, um, you know, we do expect the member identification process to be an, an iterative process, um, right, as we continue to access additional data sources that maybe we haven't been able to tap into before, um, and also, to Martha's point, receiving assessments, um, and just getting better with time. Um, there's a question uh, in the chat related to how homelessness is defined, so I am going to um, attempt to cheat here a little bit, and um, this is um, a link to um, the DHCS website um, that I was previously showing on the slide. So I'm just going to quickly scroll to the homeless definition here. So um, our population of focus for individuals and families experiencing homelessness, our individuals and families, families um, were homeless, uh, have at least one complex physical, behavioral health, or developmental health need with the inability to successfully self-manage for whom coordination of services would likely result in improved health outcomes and or decreased utilization of cost of services. Also showing um, that DHCS has based this, this definition on the HUD definition of homelessness um, with a few um, tweaks or modifications. 
I'll just pause a little bit so you can do some reading. Uh, but this is publicly available and one of my favorite documents to reference. So I will go back to my slide. The document I just pulled up here is item number five, which is the ECM key design implications and decisions. Um, and you can find it on the DHCS website. So some really good information um, as DHCS continues to roll out finalized guidance. Other questions? So Sydney, Brianna, just kind of related to this is what, um, how are we identifying who meets these criteria? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. It's a great question. Um, so um, DHCS has outlined um, in the contract guidance some specific data elements that they're looking for managed care plans um, to leverage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, many managed care plans have something called a population health algorithm that um, we use today to identify members for different population health interventions that HealthNet California Health and Wellness support. Um, so our strategy is to use that tool um, and meet and, and add on the um, enhanced care management eligibility criteria um, so that we can continue to identify uh, members for ECM. Um, you know, as we noted, it's going to be an iterative process. So um, as we get connected to more data sources, get better at member identification, understanding the needs of the population, um, you will see managed care plans getting really good at, uh, I mean, we're good at it today but specific to this new benefit, ensuring that we assign members to the appropriate providers with the expertise. Each plan might have a different method to the madness, um, but many of us are using population health algorithms with the CalAIM twist. Did that help answer the question? Anything else? Nothing else in the chat. Thank you. Um, so I've been sitting on this slide for a little bit. I um, hope you had a chance to just read some of the details. It is jam-packed. Um, on the top here, these are all of the different materials that DHCS intends to um, deliver to managed care plans to help us support the implementation benefit. Um, as you can see, there's a few things going all the way to October. Um, so though the um, guidance isn't fully um, formally finalized, uh, that does not change our implementation date. So we are ready to go for um, a day one implementation on 1-1. One, one. Um, the guidance trickling in and, and our ability to implement, we have practice um, with this before, but uh, that doesn't mean that I still don't have anxiety uh, because we really wanna ensure that we get it right. Um, so um, over here, we've received a number of these, these items, including draft enhanced care management rates, um, just making this a little bit bigger so you can see all of the wonderful things we received thus far. Um, there was a slight change in the delivery schedule. Um, those of you who have heard or seen this slide before, um, the materials that were scheduled for mid and late June have been moved to um, July. So similar to the Health Homes program where they provided, they being DHCS, provided a program guide, um, DHCS will be providing an ECM and in lieu of service pro program guide. Um, they will be publishing the in lieu of service pricing guidance. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then um, releasing some of the draft ECM and in lieu of service reporting guidance. That last item there, I'm really looking forward to getting some insights on, because um, as of today, you know, it's a little bit of guesswork as to what um, DHCS is going to be expecting for that reporting and guidance. And this is definitely another area where managed care plans want to align um, on any administrative processes and provider expectations so we can reduce administrative burden right off the bat. Um, more materials coming through August, September, and October, and underneath on the bottom of this, um, this timeline is specific to the phase one um, counties that you saw on previous slides. So July 1 is quickly approaching and our part one model of care is due. Um, so these questions include um, managed care plans, what is your initial in lieu of service selection? Um, DHCS is giving us an opportunity to come back and update those initial selections on our 9-1 submission. Um, also during July, we're going to be answering questions about um, how we're going to support uh, capacity development and ongoing capacity development to ensure all of our members who are eligible for ECM um, have access to an enhanced care management provider. And then also, which is unique to the phase one counties, um, you know, how are you working to collaborate with full person care health homes providers to transition or lift and shift the current infrastructure capabilities and programs to ECM and in lieu of services. <clears throat> in submission number two, which is due on 9-1 of 2022, um, this will include narratives and policies and procedures that the managed care plan has to provide 
to inform DHCS as to how we are going to operationalize the contract requirements um, that you see in items two and three um, on the right side there. <clears throat> and then finally in October, this is model of care part three, uh, and essentially um, the managed care plans will be providing the who will be administering the ECM and in lieu of service benefits, so declaring our network um, and providing DHCS with draft contract language for them to approve. So the model of care um, is the mechanism that the managed care plans have to complete in order to receive approval to turn on the enhanced care management and in lieu of service um, benefit. <clears throat> And then for you phase two counties out there, you're on a slightly different schedule. Um, parts one and two of the model of care will be due January 1st of 2022. Um, and then part three, where we declare the network together, um, that will be due on March 1st of 2022, again for a 7-1-2022 go live date. So lots of hustle in between now, uh, gosh, and July. And, and we probably will be talking about CalAIM all the way until 2027. Any questions on the materials that are going to be released from DHCS or the model of care schedule? No more questions in the chat. I think that this slide right here, Sydney, is just a good one to underscore the question we called at the beginning for folks to be thinking about what this all means to them and why it's so important that that, that thought process is happening and the decisions are being made and the conversations are happening because this is the timeline that state is driving and we as managed care plans have to be answering those questions as part of proving our readiness to implement. That's so this is a helpful slide. That's I will say um, my, my personally, um, my favorite um, parts of pieces of the finalized, this ECM design implementation decision. So not only does it do a great summary of the populations of focus eligibility criteria, but it also gives you insights as to where ECM and maybe county um, programs can or cannot overlap. Uh, also included the managed care pro programs there. So it gives you a really good idea about where DHCS is thinking that there is duplication of services versus not. Um, and then the other part that um, is really helpful is the um, ECM and in lieu of services change memo, memo, excuse me, where it summarizes um, the changes uh, within the in lieu of service contract templates for both managed care plans and, and the potential providers. So if you were looking for a quick way to get some updates, I recommend um, reviewing one and five for sure. Read all of them, but one and five are my favorite. And then for those of you who are tracking um, the updates and the finalized guidance from DHCS as closely or obsessively as I am, um, DHCS did release the HIC PIC coding guidance for ECM and in lieu of services last night. Um, so that's also been posted to the DHCS website. Okay, get your opportunities hat on because now we're gonna start talking about some of the fun stuff um, by sharing with what we've learned from DHCS about what's um, forthcoming. So um, just to remind you, um, you know, Brianna and, and Martha mentioned um, and challenged you to think about what role you want to play in the ES ECM space um, and the need for um, HealthNet or other managed care plans to collaborate and partner with you to develop the initial in lieu of service offering um, or the cadence when which you want to stand them up. We can stand them up in every six months. Um, and then really especially identifying those gaps or needs um, in the county and community so that we can partner to do some capacity and infrastructure um, development and strategi strategization, made up a word there. So, um, so far DHCS has released some, um, they're thinking around the incentive. Um, again, this part and piece of CalAIM is not finalized yet. We're anticipating an APL um, in the fall, but nevertheless, we wanna share what we have learned and know um, thus far so that we can all start thinking and preparing to um, partner on submitting something uh, in the fall related to um, incentive dollars. <clears throat> So in the governor's budget, um, they have allocated $600 million from 2022 through 2024. Um, this process and program design, again, is not finalized. Uh, just reminding you about the APL coming in the fall again, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, DHCS has um, defined their priorities for program year one, um, and they're really indicating that they are focused on um, incentive funds and offerings related to delivery system infrastructure, ECM capacity building, um, and in lieu of service capacity building, building uh, really trying to inspire the managed care plans to pick up um, as many of the in lieu of services as possible. Uh, it doesn't take much inspiration. We're really excited to offer some of these services. It's just about standing up a quality 
in lieu of service offering versus a quantity quantity in lieu of service offering because we really want to make sure that we hit the needs um, of the you know phased in populations of focus um, as quickly and early as possible. Um, DHCS has also released some information related to the release of payments for program year one um, and they've developed something called gate and ladder measures. So um, in so as we lead up to 2022, um, if you haven't already been engaged by your favorite managed care plans, uh, we're, we're coming for you um, and, and looking to partner and understand your insight as insights as to where we need to fill gaps and holes to ensure that we have a robust ECM benefit uh, and a strong in lieu of service offering. Um, so as we collaborate on that process and, and talk about the needs, um, we're then going to figure out um, a way to partner so that we can draw down as many dollars as possible for your county and community. Um, so come the fall, we're going to write something, a proposal, um, requesting a certain dollar amount for whatever gap that we need to fill. Um, and this is going to, and assuming it gets approved, this is going to be our gate. Um, so once our proposal is approved by DHCS, um, we will receive our first allocation of funds, which is roughly 30% in January of 2022. Um, from there, DHCS is looking um, for those proposals where they identified the latter measures or, or the milestones that we want to achieve, um, DHCS is looking for um, us all to demonstrate that we've met them so that we can receive the additional 35% of the total funds requested in July. Um, that process repeats itself again in November to receive the remaining of the 35% and, and that would be the total um, funds asked for in program year one. Um, so let me give you an example here. And I also want to uh, note that this is another area where managed care plans are collaborating and not competing. Um, so for instance, um, let's just say your county um, doesn't have a sobering center. Um, so you could possibly say, hey, HealthNet, let's partner on figuring out how to get a sobering center in my county. Um, but then let's also say that we need recuperative care in your county. And then you could turn and say to the other managed care plan, Hey, managed care plan, let's partner on a recuperative care um, for this county because the plan's goals is to inject as much funding to fill the need in the gaps um, as possible. So another area where we're really looking to collaborate and not compete um, because we can all benefit from um, all of the additional incentive dollars that will be injected into your counties and communities. DHCS is still um, figuring out the priorities for program year two. Uh, which would be 2023, and so far we know that they're looking at quality. We don't know what that includes yet, um, but you know uh, we're looking forward to uh, anything they have to provide. Any questions on the um, performance incentive? Not fully designed. This is just kind of the bare bones of what DHCS is thinking. No questions in the chat. Okay. Are you catching Callie and Fever yet? Getting excited about all the wonderful funding opportunities? <laughs> Um, all right. Um, another funding opportunity associated with um, Cal AIM is the provider access and transformation health um, dollars. So, um, when DHCS submitted the Cal AIM proposal for CMS approval, they also submitted a request for 1.25 billion with a B path support dollars over five years. Um, it's my understanding that the path dollar amount has not been finalized yet, so it could uh, potentially change. Uh, but nevertheless, I just wanted to share on the right here what it is intended to um, support. So um, PATH dollars are intended to support the or bridge funding for transition of services from whole person care to ECM and in lieu of services, strengthen the IT infrastructure of community-based organizations that are providing the enhanced care management and or in lieu of services, um, capacity for community-based organization if additional support uh, beyond the performance incentive payment is needed, um, so again, these are supposed to complement each other, not duplicate each other between the PATH dollars and the incentive dollars. Um, and then finally, for those uh, to support the recently incarcerated population of focus, providing on the ground capacity support to facilitate the justice involved initiative. Any questions on um, incentive dollars or PATH dollars? Okay, we are nearly done here, we're making it. Um, so, uh, you know, in conclusion, um, we, we're going to end on this slide because I am assuming I've nailed it. You all have Calling fever and you're just chomping at the bit to engage with plans if you haven't done so already. Um, but if you are engaged with plans, it's not, I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're ready and thinking about all of those gaps that we want to fill. 
Um, so just as a reminder, you know, we, we really are looking to understand um, the role that you, the county organization agency, want to play, um, whether it is a collaborative approach on your end, um, or if you would like us to partner directly with the individual departments, happy to do so. Um, and of course, you know, if you want to let HealthNet know, hey, I'm ready to engage, we haven't been engaged by anyone, you know, HealthNet is more than happy to um, be the facilitator and bring those other managed care plan partners to the table so that we can uh, get going in your county. Um, if you couldn't tell, we really, really, really want your insights related to in lieu of service priorities um, and gap assessment so that we can be prepared um, to, su to submit a proposal for incentive dollars in the fall. Um, so we're going to build the plane as we fly it a little bit related to the performance incentive program. <clears throat> so some just recommended next steps. Um, you know, one of the one, something that has been um, a little bit more difficult to maneuver is ensuring that managed care plans have the right um, key decision makers from the county agencies participating in these discussions. Um, we do a really nice job of walking everybody through. We'll make sure that we have a common understanding um, of the program expectations and requirements that are known today. Um, and then we, you know, together walk you through um, what this mapping exercise looks like. Um, there's a few different tools and templates out there. All of them really get to the same thing, which is what do you do today and where do we, where do we need to um, invest dollars so that we can grow and fill those capacity needs and gaps. It's important to appoint resources to support the county and community needs assessment. Um, as, you, as you probably noticed and saw, uh, we're going to be talking about CalAIM for quite a bit. Um, right now, many of the conversations are very focused on transitioning whole person care, health homes, um, but also what do we need to do to um, support the populations of focused, you know, individuals who are experiencing homelessness, adult high utilizers, adult SMI and SUD. <clears throat> and then we'll pick up more conversations or shift our conversations to the following populations of focus to ensure that we have a robust program supporting those who are um, recently incarcerated, the children with complex needs, and individuals who are at risk for long-term care um, and or in the skilled nursing facility that can transition back to community. With that, I think I have made it to the end. Um, we will be sharing this, this um, PowerPoint. And I just want to share that we included some additional things in the appendix, um, really just trying to make this as a tool or a resource for you to ground yourself in your understanding of CalAIM. Um, so again, hitting on the six uh, ECM core service components and all of the wonderful provider opportunities to be an ECM provider. Um, this one just has a little bit more explanation as to what's included in those components. Um, and then we also provide um, the in lieu of services in a brief description. And then finally, a little bit more about some of the forthcoming uh, CalAIM fun that we all have on our plates and need to ca uh, tackle together. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to um, share our information and knowledge and um, pause again for more questions. So um, this is Brianna again, so I'm sure my camera on, so I'm not just um, a voice in the dark, right? Uh, so one of the questions comes from actually one of, one of our, our counties going back to this slide and the timeline and the different phases. So I think there's probably many counties and folks on, from counties on the line um, who may be in phase one and be more familiar have had started these conversations. But those counties that are the phase two, maybe we haven't gotten to you yet, maybe it's on calendar. Um, so a question comes from um, one of those phase two counties, which is, you know, we want, if, if we're interested in talking about this, what do we do next? Um, maybe specific to HealthNet or otherwise it's specific to HealthNet. It's do we approach you or do you approach us? So let's start with that question, Cindy. Uh, it's both. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're rearing and ready to go, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share my contact information and we can go ahead and get started um, in your in your county and we can work to bring the other plan partners to the table so that we can get those conversations going. Um, you know, if you're not ready yet, just be prepared that we, we manage care plans are all strategizing to come and talk to you because we do really want to understand what role you want to play. Well, and I'll just acknowledge for the person asking the question, we, we have your information and we're happy. I'll, why don't we just say, I'll drop you a note and we'll get it started. Um, so that's, that's easy enough. And when we send the slides out, I suspect that they'll include some contact information. So you'll have your hands on it. And please, no hesitation in reaching out to um, California Health and Wellness Health Net if we are, are your plan partner in the county. And one of the other questions that came through, Sydney, I think that really speaks to our approach to it, which is, 
if we're a county that has two plans, um, can we have the two plans work together with us, you know, for this planning and mapping process? And I know you have a very strong opinion about this. So what do you think the best way to move forward on that is? Oh, we're doing it together. The, the plan partner should be at the table together in collaboration with you, hearing and listening the same things, making decisions together. Uh, really, it's a, it's a space to collaborate and not compete, and it's a space, a space I love to play in. <laughs> so just point of reference is that um, for, the, for the question that came through, that is how we've been doing our mapping process with the counties that we've been partnering with. Um, if there's another plan, which there, there always is, uh, we're doing it together for that point exactly. Um, before you hey. move on, flag related to the mapping um, parts and pieces, um, if you feel like you're behind, you're not. Um, everybody's just kind of in a different phase or place or kind of sort of a slightly different approach to tackling some of the things that we need to get done, those key decisions um, to support some of the upcoming opportunities and milestones. Um, so for instance, you know, in the GMC counties, um, we all of us plans are working together um, with, with, you know, San Diego and Sacramento to get that asset mapping done. You're absolutely right. It looks a little bit different in a two plan county where maybe we get to have a little bit more of an intimate setting because there's just a smaller group of us to work through these. Uh, and then LA is just a monster, right? Uh, so, so we've got a little bit of a different approach. So it can look different, but the outcomes and the goals um, are totally the same. And um, the managed care plans will make sure that we get there. There was, right. um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I just had another thought. Um, so one of the questions that we get quite often is, you know, will the managed care plans be aligning on, on administrative components associated with becoming an ECM provider and the administration of the benefit? The answer is yes. Um, you know, we have some practice through the Health Homes program in terms of alignment, um, and we continue to, uh, we, we intend to leverage those lessons learned and continue the ongoing collaboration with managed care plans throughout the administration of the program to make sure that whatever we say and set in place on day one, we continue to follow or tweak together in unison <laughs> as, as we figure out how to really nail um, the administration of this benefit. So just a little bit of an example, if you're interested in becoming an enhanced care management provider, the managed care plans have aligned on a process um, and some certificate and some tools. So um, if you are interested in becoming an enhanced care management or in lieu of service provider, um, the managed care plans have a letter of interest tool. Um, it's a series of check boxes just for us to quickly gauge your interest and your capabilities and where, what part of the ECM and in lieu of services um, you want to explore. Managed care plans then share that information across ourselves because again, we can piggyback on each other's um, enrollment. So for instance, if one plan enrolls um, you know, provider XYZ, um, it makes it that much easier and faster for HealthNet to also contract with that provider. So once you do the letter of interest, um, and if you are a HealthNet uh, county or provider, you might have also seen the HealthNet request for information. Another similar and same tool, just trying to gauge the, the inform or gauge your interest and understand all of the wonderful additional program offerings that you have already in place that we just didn't know about because we couldn't pay for it at the time. Um, so once we get those letters of interest or the request for information, um, the plans are, you know, internally prioritizing providers that we want to support on day one um, and, and working to engage those, those providers, whether that is individually by the managed care plan. Um, and in many counties and instances, we're, we're coming back to you, uh, responding to your letter of interest in RFI um, as, a, as a joint collaboration. So you could have more than one managed care plan. Um, on that call, you know, speaking to the engagement. And then finally, the managed care plans up and down the state, we have agreed on an enhanced care management certification tool. Um, so once we got a little bit of snippet of what you, what you can do, a few more conversations, um, we will then um, send you the certification tool, which is gonna be a little intensive. Uh, it is 20 pages, but definitely details that we need to ensure that we can certify, if you will, um, your expertise in serving that population of focus. Um, so just an example of where we are trying to align um, and, and that certification tool can be sent to all of your favorite managed care plans in which, whichever county that you uh, live in and, and we will all be accepting them. All right, that's it for reals this time. <laughs> Thank you, go for it, Martha, close us out. <laughs> Yeah, so no, I, I just really wanted to personally thank you all for joining today. And um, as you heard, our friend Sid, we're very excited. I hope, you know, that came through loud and clear. 
Um, and I'll just leave you with, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of a couple of thoughts. One is, um, we've been really trying to make sure that we simplify things as best as we can by partnering with other health plans. You know, one of the things that we keep hearing uh, from our partners at the county level is that we've managed to make things quite complicated. <laughs> right? And I don't know, it's just, it's not just the function of the health plans, but just in general, the system and the industry has been com very complicated over the years. And this is a very unique opportunity for us to do things um, differently. So I wanna just, you know, acknowledge the need for us to collectively do that. Um, the other thing is that this is a very unique opportunity for us to really advance our agenda on full integration. And so while a lot of our focus today was around how we partner with you as you know, county and local agencies, over time, our intention is to bring to the table a cross sector of the community to think about integration more holistically. What does it mean to integrate with you know, the primary care side of the equation here? With um, the plans, the plans have a very important role, physicians have a very important role, hospitals have a very important role. And so um, it's the beginning of a very long journey. Um, you know, we're very hyper-focused on trying to just work with the state to finalize the details of the program, get our pieces stood up, but um, it really does set the table for uh, what I think our members, patients, clients deserve and need, which is a seamless system of care. So we're very excited about it. And again, just really wanna thank you um, and look forward to engaging with all of you um, in earnest. All right, there's no more questions in the chat, so I think that brings our webinar to an end. Thank you again to everyone. Uh, Randy Kay, were there any other final closing comments? I think we had uh, wonderful questions that came through, and I appreciate the responses that you were able to provide. We've got a few questions, just folks looking for the slide deck, so we'll be sure to send that out along with the recording. And I just want to thank that the HealthNet, Centene, CalAIM team here uh, for making all of this information accessible, available, and easy to understand, and truly appreciate the time that all of our uh, participants gave to us and the great questions that came through. And lastly, I want to thank CSAC and CSAC Finance Corporation for bringing this all together. So um, I'll go ahead and close out our webinar and just uh, share, the, share the materials with you, and I'll be sure to uh, be available for any questions that come through on email. I'll pass them along to, to the HealthNet and Health and Wellness team. Thank you. Appreciate everyone. Bye.